All right, so section 3.3 .3 is dealing with multiplication and division of whole numbers. So our common core standard for third grade, we have to be able to, students have to be able to interpret products of whole numbers. So that's kind of our goal. How can we help students fulfill this common core standard? We've got third grade. At this level, we should be able to interpret, interpret products of whole numbers. So how do we get there? Typically we start off with a repeated addition model. So something along those lines. Repeated addition model. What does that look like? That would be something, for example, if we were trying to compute 3 times 8, we could rewrite that as 3 sets of 8 and then turn multiplication into repeated addition. So again, if we just kind of take this statement and break it down, if I have 3 sets of 8, if I've got 3 sets of 8 together, then we're relying on a previously learned and mastered skill, just addition instead of multiplication. So three sets of eight together gives us 24. Okay, we can break it down into that repeated addition model. Something else that we could do, kind of a student activity to get the, the brain working. A student activity that we could give to students of third grade class. What could we do? Set up a bunch of manipulatives. So there's something physical that we can count, that we can manipulate and work with. Any kind of concrete model like that is always going to be beneficial, especially at a young age. So a student activity that we could do is kind of build up this concept using manipulatives. So let's just say we've got some blocks, and we're going to set up three groupings of four blocks. I mean, obviously they would be physical in the real class, but hey, you have to do it virtual sometimes. But we're just going to mimic this pattern three times. And we could ask our students, okay, well, how many do we have here? And what are the different representations for the computations that are going on here? Again, working towards multiplication, but relying on skills that they already have, uh, repeated addition. So in this case, we could ask, we've got three groups of what? Make it unknown. We could ask them that. So what do we have? We've got three groupings of four per set, and we have them all identical for that purpose. We've got three groups of four. How else could we say it? Repeated addition. How many do I have in the first group? I've got four of them. How many blocks do we have in the second group? We've got four of them. How many in the third? We've got four of them. So all together, how many do we have? 12 of them in total, and they could physically go through and count every single block and get there. And then we want to work towards that multiplication. So three groupings of four, or repeated addition, produce 12. So three times what produces what? This again would be the setup that we would give the students. An example like this with manipulatives and ask them to kind of fill in the blanks, fill in the boxes. So I've got three groupings, again, of how many four everywhere, and what does it produce? We've seen the result with repeated addition. Three times four, 12. So again, easier way to uh, present the information with a manipulative instead of talking theoretical with, with children. So how can we express this explicitly uh, and generally? So specifically, we were working with three and four, but if we make it general, if I have n times a, and I want to write that as repeated addition. So I have this factor A, and specifically it's showing up how many times. How many groupings of it do we have? N of them. So we can, again, write it out generically into repeat addition. And how many factors of A do I have here? Whatever my constant on the front is. I've got N number of terms. Another way that we could concretely represent uh, multiplication would be what's called a rectangular array. Rectangular 
array. Just another method to get the same point across, but what happens with this? We have a certain number of objects, but we arrange it in such a way that there's the same number of objects per row and per column. So we make it very uniform. So in a rectangular array, the objects are arranged with the same number of objects, of objects in each row and column. So real life example, again, something very concrete that students would be used to, an egg carton is an example of a rectangular array. I've got a certain number of objects, typically a dozen, and how are they grouped? So in my little egg carton here, we got a dozen eggs and we split them up into two arrays. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six eggs. One, two, three, four, five, six eggs. So in this case, our array demonstrates what multiplication? So my rows, I've got two of them. So I've got two rows and how many columns or how many eggs across? One, two, three, four, five, six. So two times six gives us 12, the rectangular array that's there. Another way to present it. Another property coming from multiplication is what's called a Cartesian product. And basically, or a Cartesian model, basically what happens, it allows us to combine uh, two elements or more in various different ways. I'll give an example, it'll make sense. So a Cartesian product model, let's look at an example. Cartesian product model. And we'll get into the concrete, what is a Cartesian product in terms of sets, but for now we're just thinking real world, big picture uh, kind of setup. So something that we're used to seeing in real life would be an example like this. Suppose you can order a burger on light or dark bread. So we've got that one option, light or dark, with one condiment. So we can have light or dark bread and then we can pick one condiment. Condiment. And our options, I'm just going to choose some for us. Mustard is one option. Ketchup is the other and mayo is the last. So basically we want to figure out, well, what are the different combinations? What are all of the possible combinations that could be produced from these two options? So we write out what's called a tree diagram. So we kind of have a visual representation of what's going on here. So what again are our options? The first choice, we have to determine whether we want light or dark red. So that's the first branch on our tree. I could either have dark red or I could have light red. So let's just say that I do choose dark red, then within that choice, I have three condiments to choose from. So again, inside of the dark bread, I've got three different options. I could have dark bread with mustard, I could have dark bread with ketchup, or I could have dark bread with mayo. And you're probably thinking, yeah, I could have those same options within the light bread, and you would be correct. We could have mustard, we could have ketchup, we could have mayo on our light bread. So we kind of follow those tree diagrams to talk about the different options that are possible. So within our first tree, our first Cartesian product that we're looking at, basically just the different combinations that are possible, what could we have? I could have dark mustard, dark bread with mustard. I could have dark with ketchup. Or I could have dark with mayo. We've got three options within the dark bread. Then within the light, we have those same three, but now we have light with mustard, light with ketchup, and light with mayo. So within those combinations, how many did we actually produce? So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six different options that were produced 
from that Cartesian product. And if we look at it, how many options did we have between the bread options? Two of them, light and dark. How many different options did we have from condiments? One, two, three. So the Cartesian product between two and three is six, all the different combinations that are possible. So how do we define that Cartesian product? How do we define multiplication in terms of the Cartesian product? So for any finite sets, so countable, for any finite sets, A and B, doesn't matter what they consist of, but they're countable, uh, meaning finite, if the cardinality of A is little a, and the cardinality of B, or the cardinal number, those two are synonymous, is little b, then how do we define the multiplication between those two? Then a times b, the multiplication of those cardinal numbers is defined as what? The cardinal number of the Cartesian product, like we've just seen. So we had two different options for bread, three different options for the condiments, and the Cartesian product, the cardinality of it, was six, the multiplication of the two of them. So we have that formal definition. All right, so another Common Core standard for third grade. What else should they, they be able to do at this point? We should be able to apply these properties. Properties to whole numbers. And specifically, what properties of whole numbers are we dealing with? We're going to look at four of them. And we need to know these different definitions. So the first one we're going to examine is closure. Closure is super important when we're talking about a set of numbers. And basically, what this says is if I take two whole numbers, let's just call them A and B. So if I take an A and a B, two different numbers, and they live within the whole numbers. So again, what is that saying? I got two numbers, they're not the same, and they're whole numbers. If we multiply them, if I take A times B, then it also has to be a whole number. It has to be closed under this operation, under multiplication. So then A times B is a unique whole number. So if I take two whole numbers and I multiply them together, it should produce a whole number. And if it does, then it is closed under multiplication. It also could be closed under addition. We have to satisfy those when we examine that property as well. If I take two whole numbers and add them together, it should produce a unique whole number closed under addition. So we're examining multiplication for now, and we've got closure. Next has to be commutative. Commutative. Commutative property of blah. We've looked at that a lot in different algebra courses uh, at this university. What is this telling us? The order does not matter. So A times B has to be the same as B times A. If we're taking, again, A and B from the whole numbers. So if they come from this set, the order doesn't matter with multiplication. 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. The commutative law allows us to do that. Next, associative. Associative law, what does that allow us to do? Associate things together, meaning grouping. So if I have three whole numbers and they're being multiplied, the order should not matter. If I compute A times B first, and then multiply by C, it should be the same as if I do what? B times C, and then multiply by A. We should get the same result, again, if all of those values come from the set of whole numbers. Associative means we can re uh, regroup. And fourth, an identity. What does an identity do? Doesn't change something. Your identity is constant. It's never changing. So there has to exist. There exists 
one in the whole numbers, the number one, such that when we actually multiply a different whole number by one, we should get that same number back out. So if I multiply one times a, it should produce a, when a comes from the set of whole numbers. So the identity does not change what we're multiplying by. So the multiplicative identity is one. We can multiply by one and it doesn't change anything. What is the additive identity? Additive identity, what can we add to anything without changing it? Zero. So the operation that we're working under is very important because the identity for multiplication isn't zero because zero times anything is going to be zero, gets rid of it all instead of producing an identity. So the operation that we're working underneath is super important to consider. So how can we visually represent these different laws for students? An easier way to understand. So a visual display for the commutative law, what would happen? Commutative. Again, commutative means what? We can commute things, we can change the order. So if we had a setup of three by two blocks. So three rows by two columns, if we do it in that way, then it should produce the same if I take it and I turn it sideways. Then I have two by three blocks, two rows, three columns, should produce the same. Take it, turn it sideways. The order does not matter. For associative, what could we do? Similar story. Associative means grouping. So to visually represent the associative law, what could happen? We could physically choose some values. And again, write out or have them manipulate the different blocks. So 5 times 4, and if I stack that 3 high, it should be the same as if I have 3 times 5. And then I stack it 4 high should produce the same number of units inside of there. I'm going to get a new marker. So the last law that we're going to look at, number five, what does it look like? Oh, much better. Number five in our list, the multiplicative property of zero for whole numbers. So for some a, for some number inside of the whole numbers, a times zero is always going to produce zero. Gets rid of everything. And how could we, again, visually display this for students? If I have six times zero, what does this tell me? How many factors of zero do we actually have? Six of them if we turn it into the repeated addition. So if we physically write this out, I got zero plus zero plus zero, four, by six of them, it's still going to produce zero off after all that time. Okay. Next kind of property, not necessarily a law, but a property that we're going to look at is the distributive property. Distributive. So what does this tell us we're allowed to do over addition and subtraction? These are the, the the operations that we're examining over addition and subtraction. I guess it's kind of important to write on there for now. We'll delineate with multiplication and division eventually. But typically, we use these two. So what does that look like? If I have 5 times 3 plus 4, we have two different options in order to compute this. We could combine 3 and 4 together, then multiply by 5. It might be easier, and typically is easier for students, to distribute in and do the multiplication with smaller numbers and the addition with the larger numbers. So if we distribute 5 into our parentheses here, over addition, what does it produce? 5 times 3, and then we're adding on to that 5 times 4. These numbers are a little bit easier to compute. 5 times 3 is 15, 5 times 4 is 20. So again, addition with larger numbers is typically going to be easier than multiplication with larger numbers for young students. So we get out of here at 35. And we know, yes, if we add those, then multiply by 5, we get the same value. Another way that we could look at this, this product, 
is to write out that repeated addition. So this tells me what? I've got five factors of three plus four. So if we physically write it out, I got three plus four plus three plus four plus three plus four plus three plus four plus three plus four. Multiplication is repeated addition. So if we combine all of those together, the associative law allows us to get rid of the parentheses, and the commutative law allows us to reorder these. So we could group together what? All of the threes and all of the fours. So how many threes do we have in this case? One, two, three, four, five of them. And how many fours do we have? One, two, three, four, five of them. And what are the sum of these? How else could we rewrite repeated addition of these threes? Well, I have five of them of this factor. How many fours do we have? Five of that factor. So again, proving it in a different way. Five times three is 15, five times four is 20. We still get the same value. So we want to be able to represent these different laws and these new concepts in a lot of different ways because one student might like this version a lot, the other one might really understand, conceptualize what's going on if we go with this route of explanation. So from that, we have two different theorems that are produced. We're gonna write down the version with addition and with subtraction. So A times the quantity B plus C, we can distribute over addition and we'll get A times B plus A times C. Again, for all of those living inside of the whole numbers. Same story for distributing over subtraction. We got a times b minus a times c. But in this case, we have to delineate and say that b has to be greater than or equal to c. Otherwise, we're dipping into the negatives, and the negatives aren't a part of the whole numbers. So we have to delineate in this case, b has to be larger than c, so this turns out to be positive, and it still lives within the whole numbers. It has to be closed. So what's the point of this? Typically, students find this law useful for mental computations. So usually it's useful for mental computation. So what does that mean? For example, if I give you, or a student, 13 times 7 might be a little daunting mentally to compute it. We could write it out on paper really quickly, but we could break this up and use some of these laws. So 13 is the same as 10 plus 3 times 7. So now we can compute what? 7 times 10, which is 70, and 7 times 3, which is 21. Now again, we've broken a complicated multiplication down into a simple arithmetic addition problem. 70 and 21 together gives us 91. So again, students gravitate towards that because it's a little bit easier to compute on the fly, mental computation. So what are some examples to demonstrate these properties? Again, visually. We could use an area model to show that x plus y times z plus w really is the product of these. So how do we find these? We distribute over addition and we FOIL. It's just the order that's chosen so we make less mistakes. From the first, we will get xz when we multiply, and x times w, we get xw. y times z, we got yz. And y times w, we get yw. So visually, we could represent this uh, by drawing out an area, an area of a rectangle. So what do I have? X plus Y. So let's say I have length X on this side, and I have length Y on this side as well. So length X is pretty small. Put a delineator in between there, a little bit of a division. And then Y is a little bit longer. And I'm multiplying this by what? Z plus W. So let's represent that length in terms of z and w. So maybe z looks like this, that length. And w, I'm going to make a tiny little one. This is just w. w is pretty small. 
So they're kind of representative of some arbitrary lengths. And again, we could figure out what are the individual areas. If we connect all of these and make it into a rectangle, how do we compute it? So again, if z is this long, then z has to be that long everywhere. And if w is this long, w has to be this long everywhere. Same story for vertically. If x is this long, x has to be this long everywhere. And if y is this long, if we connect them all together, we've got four different rectangles in a square, also considered a rectangle, to work with. So what is the area of this entire thing? So if we want to compute the area for this small rectangle, what is its length and what is its width? Well, width is x and length is z. So length times width, what does it produce? x, z. You can see our first term. Okay, what else is it going to produce if we move over here? I've got width x and length w, so the area of this square is going to be x, w. Again, second term that we're looking at. Down here, what are we going to get? y, z. And all the way in this rectangle, we got y, w. Again, the other two terms that are involved. So when we multiply x plus y, this length, times z plus w, this width, we're going to get the sum of the individual little squares. Visual representation of what's going on. How else could we look at this? Um, if we look at x plus y times z plus w. If we think of x plus y as one number itself, if we think, since it's closed under addition, it will be a whole number itself. So x and y together will produce just one value. If we treat it as one value, then we can distribute that entire thing to each of these pieces. So we could have x plus y times z, distributing, and x plus y times w. Another way to look at it. And now again, we can distribute over addition again. So what are we going to have? xz, yz, xw, YW. Again, we get the same result, and the order does not matter. We can commute all of these. So this same order is the same, represents the same value as this different order. So let's take a set definition and actually prove that it's closed under the operation addition. So we're looking at this example. We want to prove that the set A, which consists of 6 times some number, and that number has to come from the whole numbers, is closed under addition. So if I take two numbers from this set, then it should still live within that set if I add them together. That's what this is saying. So we have to first define two numbers that live inside of A. So I'm going to let A and B belong to A. Then what does that tell us? What do those numbers actually look like? If I pick two numbers from this set, they look like what? Six times some natural number. Both of them do. So then we could rewrite A as six times some number. I'm going to call it K. Where K lives inside of the holes. And B is six times some other number. Where L comes from the whole numbers. And you can label them whatever you want. K, L, J, P, Q, doesn't matter. They have to live inside of the whole numbers. Okay, so if we combine these two together with addition, then if I add A plus B together, what does it physically look like? Well, A is represented as 6 times some number, and B is represented as 6 times some other number. Will this still live within that set? Will it be closed under addition? So, yeah. What's common between these two that we could take out of both? A factor of 6. And again, we're trying to make it fit this form. 6 times some number that lives inside of the holes. So when I take 6 out of each of these terms, we get k plus l. And what can we tell about those things? They're coming from the whole numbers. So we fit our definition. Yes, if I combine two numbers that live inside of this specific set, and we combine them with addition, then yes. 
Therefore, A plus B lives inside of A and is closed, closed under addition. And we basically proved it. It's proof form, so at the end we want to have some kind of symbol to represent this proof is finished. We've reached the conclusion. So we've looked at multiplication of whole numbers, so let's look at division of whole numbers and see the similarities and the differences. Division of whole numbers. There's a couple different uh, models that we're going to look at. The first one being a set model. Another way to look at it is a partition model. To partition something means to basically break it up into different groupings. Number two, we're going to be looking at a missing factor model. And number three, repeated what? Multiplication was repeated addition, division is repeated subtraction. So they do have quite a few similarities. So let's look at an example. First example, I'm just going to describe it to you verbally. Suppose we have 18 cookies. I've got 18 of them. And we want to give an equal amount to each of three friends. We want to say equal to three friends. How many should each student or each person receive? So visually, we could draw this out. We could actually have the cookies in class, which would be great. And how many? We've got 18 of them. So I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And we can use an array to represent it. So in this case, if I have to break up these 18 cookies equally into three different pieces, we can kind of chunk them together. Well, I kind of can see the division where we have equal amounts everywhere. And how do we get there? So I've got 18 if I divide it into three equal pieces. If I split it into thirds, how many cookies live within each partition? There are six of them. So once we've partitioned it into those equal sets, we have these equivalent subsets. We can combine all those together and we still have 18 cookies. Another way to look at it Instead of just partitioning, we could solve for this missing factor. So if each friend receives C cookies, so the same example but a different representation. If each person receives C cookies, then there are how many friends? Three of them, so 3C is going to have to be equal to 18. Since the number of friends, they receive C cookies. And there's three of them in total. The multiplication is a little bit easier to commute instead of division. So three times what produces 18? This tells me that C has to be 6. A different way to look at it, solving for that missing factor. Another way that we could describe this process to students is with that repeated subtraction model. So suppose we rephrase the same question in a different way. Suppose we have 18 cookies, and we want to package them in cookie boxes that hold six cookies each. How many boxes are going to be needed? So if each box needs to contain six cookies each, if I fill one box, I've used up how many cookies? 18 minus 6. I filled one box, so now I've got how many left? I've got 12 left. And I have one box filled. If I fill another box from those 12, I'm removing another 6. So 12 minus 6 again, we've got 6 left. Now we've got two boxes filled. And then the third one, I've got 6 cookies left, so that'll fill a third box. So in total, we're going to have three boxes. Another way to look at it. If I take 18 and divide it by 6, it produces 3, partitioning them easily. So this repeated subtraction model works really well if there are no remainders. No remainders, meaning we don't have any cookies left over. Okay, when we do have remainders, the conversation is a little bit different. But let's go ahead and look at this actual division algorithm. 
So as we actually work towards a division algorithm, we have to ask, is this set of whole numbers actually closed under division? And the answer is no. And to prove a counterexample, let's just look at what is 27 divided by 5? Does that live inside of the whole numbers? So if I take 27 and try to divide it up into five parts equally, another way to look at it would be to ask, 5 times what value produces 27? Is that value a whole number? So 5 times 5 is 25. It gets us pretty close to our goal. And 5 times 6 is 30, which overshoots our goal. So that tells me the number of factors that I need is somewhere in between 5 and 6. It's in between these values. And any number that's in between those two, in between 5 and 6, is not going to be a whole number. It's not going to live within this set. So it is not closed. The set of whole numbers, set of whole numbers, is not closed under division. Basically what that says is we can have remainders. So practical applications are pretty common with this concept. For example, if I have 32 apples to divide among six students equally, how many are each of them going to receive? I've got 32 apples to divide among six people. So each of them is going to get five. Six times five is 30, but we have how many left over? Two that are left over. So we have a, a remainder, remainder of two in this example. So how do we uh, visually display that? If I take 32 and divide it by six, it goes in five times, but there's a remainder of two. If you take those 32 apples, divide it among six people, they're all going to receive five of them, and I have two left over that we can't do anything with. So how could we check this with multiplication then? So before, we kind of rephrase this division in terms of multiplication. We can do the same for every division case. We can rewrite it as multiplication. So in this case, what do we have? 5 times 6 plus our remainder, since it's positive, has to produce 32. So we get 30 plus another 2, we get there. So let's take a question and try to figure out if 123 is divided by a number, divided by some number, and the remainder is 13. So I take 123, I divide it by some number, and my remainder is 13. We want to figure out what are the possible divisors. Divisors. Basically, what are our options? What could we actually divide by to produce this? So what does this actually look like? 123, if we divide by some number and we have remainder of 13. So 123 is going to look like what in terms of multiplication? So two numbers being multiplied together, like we had here, plus our remainder has to produce this result. So we don't know what the values are. We're divided by some number, and we don't know what it produced, but we know that the remainder is 13. So two numbers, I'm going to call 1B and 1Q. Two numbers being multiplied together will get us pretty close to 123, but we also had a remainder of 13. Okay? In this case, we also want to say that B has to be larger than 13, so it still lives within the whole number. So how do we start to solve for what values, what divisors actually work here? So what does this tell us? If I want to solve for BQ, how do we get rid of 13? We subtract it. So 123 minus 13 is going to be equal to BQ. And 123 minus 13 produces what? 110. So two things being multiplied together produce 110. So product of two numbers, and one of them has to be larger than 13 for this to happen. Otherwise, we could dip into the negatives. So what are the different products that we're looking at? The product of two numbers, two numbers, and one is larger than 13. 
So what two numbers could we multiply together to get us to 110? Boring case, 1 in itself. That'll get us there. Next value, 2 and 55. Is 110 divisible by 3? No, by 4, no, but we can go up to 5. 110 divided by 5 gives us 22. And the last factor, 10 and 11. Okay, so out of all of those possible factors that we could divide by, what are our options? They have to be larger than 13 for it to work. So 1 is out, 2 is out, 5 is out, 10 is out, 11 is out, 22 is in, 55 is in, is 110 in? Definitely not, because we need the product of two of them to produce this value. And if I plug in 110 for one of them, the other one, there isn't going to be another factor. It's going to be 1, and that one's out. So our options are 22 possible values, possible values, 22, and 55. And we could double check if we actually throw it in. If I take 123 and I divide it by 22, what is it going to produce? 5 with a remainder of how many? 13. So we have that case done. 123, if we divide it by 55, our other option, it's going to produce two of them. And we have a remainder of what? 13. All right, so an example for you. Try. Provide some counterexamples to show that the whole numbers is not closed under division and that division is neither commutative nor associative. So we want to provide counterexamples, counterexamples to show it's not closed, it's not commutative, and it's not associative. So let's go for closed first. Choosing two numbers that live inside of the holes such that when we divide them, they don't live inside of that same set. For example, if I take 8 and divide it by 5, what kind of a number does it produce? A decimal, we're not dealing with a whole number. Not a whole number. So that tells me it's not closed under division. I can't take any two random whole numbers, divide them, and expect to get a whole number back out. So it's not closed. To prove it's not commutative, commutative means what? We change the order. So if I take 8 and I divide it by 2, what will that produce? Produces 4. And if I change that order around, 2 divided by 8 is going to produce what? 1 fourth. Those are not the same, so the order was important. We can't commute things with division doesn't work. Associative works pretty much the same. We just have to change the groupings around. So let's take 8 and divide it by 4, then divide it by 2. And then we're going to prove it's not the same as if I take 8 divided by 4 divided by 2. So the parentheses tell me compute this piece first. So 8 divided by 4 gives us what? 2. And 2 divided by 2 gives us 1. So I've got 1. And 1 is not going to be equal to what? What's produced on this side. So 8, we're not touching that one yet. We have to compute first 4 divided by 2, which is 2. And 8 divided by 2 is 4. So we did not produce the same, the same result when we changed the grouping. So it's not associative under division. Last piece to consider. Let's try to find the values. Try to find the values of... 3 divided by 0, 0 divided by 3, and 0 divided by 0. What happens in each of these cases? So let's look at the first one. If we set it up in such a way that we could rewrite it as multiplication, what is it going to look like? So I'm just going to set it equal to C, some value. The multiplication would look like what? C times 0 would have to produce 3. So is there a value? such that when I multiply it by 0, it produces 3. No, there's no number that we can multiply by 0 and produce 3, so this thing is undefined. We can never divide by 0. Things explode. It can't happen. But if we change the order, I'm going to set this one equal to D, something different, 
so we can set it up as multiplication. D times 3 has to produce 0. D times 3 has to produce 0. So what D value do we need there? A 0 to make everything go away. So D has to be 0. That one is defined. And what about 0 divided by 0? Again, if we set it equal to something, F times 0 equal to 0. We can plug in any value that we want for f. 1 will work, 2 will work, 3,058 will work. It's not unique. And by definition, it has to produce a unique value, uh, this division. Division has to produce this unique value. Only one option, but in this case, we've got infinitely many options. So it's no unique number is defined. So, we consider this one undefined as well. And again, the easiest way just to remember it, we're dividing by zero. So, the thing is undefined. So, division by zero is always undefined. Division by zero is undefined. Important thing to remember. And the last thing that we want to discuss is the order important inside of a combination of a few different operations? So yes, the order matters. Let's look at this case. If I have 2 plus 3 times 6. I have two operations, so I could combine one operation, the addition first, or I could go multiplication first. So let's look at those two cases and see if they produce the same. So if I compute the addition, is it going to be the same? as if I compute the multiplication first. And the parentheses just tells us that. This is what I'm computing first, this is what I'm computing first. So 2 plus 3, we get 5. 5 times 6 is what we're looking at on the left. Is it the same as 2 plus what? 6 times 3, what does it produce? 18. So 5 times 6, what do we get there? 30. And 2 plus 18, we get 20. So, no, those two things are not the same. This, the order is super important. And the acronym to help us remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division, addition and subtraction. So, multiplication and division, we just move left to right. Addition and subtraction, when that's all that we have involved, we move left to right in that case as well. So, let's take one last example with a combination of a bunch of different operations and see what we have to compute first. So 8 minus 9 divided by 3 times 2 plus 3. So we don't have any parentheses, we don't have any exponents, so multiplication and division has to happen from left to right. So the division and the multiplication are next to each other. So I'm going to put parentheses in there to say, hey, this is what we're computing first. So we have to deal with what's on the inside from left to right before we can deal with the subtraction and addition. So we haven't touched the 8, it's still there, and we're still subtracting off what other value this produces. And let's see what it produces. So 9 divided by 3 gives us 3, and 3 times 2 produces 6. We had to do those in order from left to right first. And now since we have just addition and subtraction involved, we take those from left to right. So 8 minus 6, what does that produce? 2. 2 plus 3, we get 5. So the order is super important. 